Hey folks, Richard Tubb here with another episode of Tub Talk, the podcast for IT consultants. Now, my guest today is Scott Riley, the founder of Cloud Nexus. Cloud Nexus are a UK-based consultancy that provides advice and strategy on technology solutions for small and medium-sized businesses. More about that shortly. Now, Scott is an expert in Microsoft 365 and Azure, and as you'll hear, his approach to helping businesses is refreshingly honest, and no pun intended, given his focus on cloud solutions, a very grounded approach. Scott, welcome to Subtalk. Oh, Richard, thank you. And thank you for that amazing introduction. That was absolutely beautiful. I had a tear in my eye. That was, that was amazing. <laughs> but no, well, I should say for listeners, if, if, if you and I are sounding very, very upbeat and jovial now, A, we're always like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> but secondly, just before we came on air, we were actually comparing uh, backgrounds and we're both big Marvel geeks. Uh, we're both into uh, 80s uh, bits and pieces. So we were talking yeah. Atari, we're talking Transformers. You were showing off your DeLorean and everything else. So <laughs> well, we you, are, we you, are in the zone, aren't we? We are. You were showing off an acoustic coupler, which took me all the way back to war games and, and real childhood. So no, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in a real... I was going to say I'm super jazzed, but wow, yeah. No, I'm, I'm really energized for this. This is awesome. <laughs> well, it's great to have you on the show. Um, I, I can't believe we've not had you on sooner because I was thinking back to when we first met. Help me out here. It was either a GFI Max conference in 2012-ish or perhaps yeah. even earlier than that. I think you've got it right. And I was trying to rack my brain for this as well, because it's been years and we we keep like ships in the night. We keep seeing each other at conferences and I will have different people introduce me and say, hey, have you met Richard? Tumble? Yeah, we, we we go back. And I, I, I cannot remember how far back, but I do remember um, two specifically. One was a, a CompTIA event that we were we were both at where we had a fantastic conversation about what was happening you know, at that mm -hmm. stage. But the other was a Marcus Sheridan event up in Edinburgh. Yeah, uh, where marketing yeah, you and I went to the Content Marketing Academy. You were presenting on stage that day, but it was a great opportunity to spend time with Marcus. And you know, this was whilst he was still trying to finish the book. You know, uh, <laughs> they ask you answer, yes. um, but just you know, absolutely fantastic to be here, and I'm, I'm delighted to be part of the show. Oh well, bless you for coming on, mate. Really appreciate it. Now. You and I obviously know each other very well, but for those listeners who haven't met you, could you share like a potted version of your journey in the MSP space? Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, it's it's been, I counted up, it's been 21 going on 22 years. And I realized I, I look so much younger than that. Yeah. Um, but it's, you know, I've always been in MSP. This is the, the weird thing. We might not have called it that at the time, but I've always been in the service provider world. And I started in some very techie roles, you know, doing like uh, Cisco routers and networks and firewalls and all that kind of stuff. Um, and at some point, I think they realized that I was quite good at talking to people um, and, you know, kind of putting it in, maybe they explain it like I'm five or, you know, pretend you've got crayons and draw it for me. And so they they kind of put me into a joint role that was managing technical teams and kind of getting the best out of them, but also working in pre-sales. So very much chatting to customers, where are they going? What are their challenges? And because I had that dual role in a, in a lot of the, the career that I then followed, I was able to sort of see what the customers needed, see what the challenges were, and then help influence the design of the, the services in the back end with the engineers. And so we started to really shape things that would work. Now, I did that for many, many years for some of the big, big service providers. Uh, and I'm thinking people like, uh, you know, it was big at the time, I guess, but like Pipex, which became Vialtus and GX Networks. Uh, ultimately, the whole thing got consumed by Daisy. And I moved off to Phoenix IT Services for a few years, heading up their cloud team there. That became Daisy. I'm kind of concerned that the next move that I might make, keep moving, that they keep getting bought by Daisy. Uh, but they <laughs> <laughs> they have, but they were at the time. I think on a bit of a, a you know, an a acquisition spree. But what I've I've done through all that is kind of grown through those ranks of being very, very technical, very customer facing, and then moving into the more management roles. And in my final, I, I guess my real final position over at um, GCI a couple of years ago, um, I was actually in the exec team, and so I was helping there do mergers and acquisitions. You know, we went through I think seventeen acquisitions whilst I was there, where we would buy another MSP and, and fold them in. And part of my role was to understand, you know, what did they do? Where did they make their money? What services did they had? How would that complement what we did as an overall MSP and, and how would it add to the portfolio? And I think genuinely one of my proudest moments there is when we acquired outsourcery out of administration. Um, and so we we kind of took on this, I, I'll, I'll be honest, it was a mess. We, we took on this mess 
there was you know 200 or so people and and i think we managed to save around 120 jobs when we took that in and, and that in itself is something that i'm just kind of like that's amazing you know to, to bring that in now i kind of stepped in as interim md and we we did this huge turnaround on a business that was losing a huge amount of money each month and we flipped it within about nine weeks we flipped it around to make it profitable in nine weeks. Now, don't get me wrong, there were some hard miles and there was a lot of decisions that we had to make, but probably one of the, the biggest tests, I think, of character for me, uh, and one of the biggest learning moments was actually kind of stepping in as, as MD of, of that failed business and turning it around. Um, but yeah, you know, that has, has led me nicely on to where I am now, where I eventually left GCI. I had a tiny little shareholding. And when we sold the business to a PE fund, I sort of sailed off into the sunset on my private yacht. No, I might have had a Greg's and, and a celebration, <laughs> but there was enough there for me to sort of say, you know, what do I want to do next? I'm at a comfortable choosing point. Um, and I did some bits of work in between and then eventually settled in in just two years ago now on founding Cloud Nexus. Um, and I thought I knew a lot about running cloud divisions and, and running business and that kind of thing. You know, when I started at GCI, we had no cloud business. We, when I left, it was like a 34 million pound part of the organization. I'm like, yeah, I think I know something about this. That's nothing to run in your own business. There's, yeah. there's so many lessons to learn. So describe for us what Cloud Nexus does. And, and before you do that, I'm just going to rewind and say, I mentioned in your intro, you've had experienced exceptional growth in the last 18 months. But let's put that into context because Cloud Nexus has been running for two years, is it? Uh, in, in September, yeah. So we started September 2019. So in other words, since pretty much since day one of starting this business, Cloud Nexus, you have experienced phenomenal growth. So I just want to yeah. say publicly, kudos on that. Congratulations. You absolutely deserve it. But for anybody not familiar with Cloud Nexus, how do you describe what you do? Yeah, so we we pretty much what, what I had when I left those big MSPs was I'd, I'd come to the conclusion that we'd been battling against big service providers like Office 365 and Azure, and we'd been building our own private solutions to kind of compete against those for a long time. And as I left, I kind of said to myself, look, if I was going to do this again, what I would want to do is take the power of something like Office 365 and Azure, take those really clever guys and that passion for technology and solving customer challenges and just put the two together. Don't have our own data centers, don't have our own cloud platforms. Just take that expertise and absolute genius level knowledge and wrap it around 365 and Azure and just become this boutique consultancy. And that is what became Cloud Nexus. And, and it started with me. And literally, this is one of those, it started with me in my bedroom type thing. And you're quite right. And we'll, we'll come to it in a second. You know, two years later, it's a very different story. Um, but it is just this niche focus. We don't pretend to be good at everything. And, and that is absolutely like core to what we do. We don't pretend to be good at everything. We're good at 365. We're good at Excel. We're bloody good. I like to say it's, you know, we're a bit of a one trick pony, but it's a bloody good trick. Um, but that's what we do. And so we help businesses really adopt and make the most out of 365 from a technical and operational perspective. We're not really kind of training people in how to use the tools that much. That is part of it. But we do a lot of onboarding, a lot of security assessments, a lot of hardening things and making sure people are protected. And I think we just had a real good time, you know, and, and motion thing going on. When COVID hit, it was, we were five, six months old and everybody needed to get get out, get off premise, get get working from anywhere, get our files into the cloud, get our emails into the cloud, fix these VPN problems. We all need to work. So we had a huge influx of work uh, to just help people migrate and 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 get get working from anywhere. And then over the summer, you know, that kind of died down a little bit. We'd kind of got everybody where they needed to be. And we've had businesses say, hey, you know, thank you. We're still going because you put teams in and you got us all running and, and our business has survived because of you. And I'm like, Genuinely, I'm touched. I love that. Okay. Um, but as it got to like the kind of the end of the summer, it was more about, you know, we made we made that move either with you or with someone else, but we made that move to the cloud really quickly. Did we cut any corners? Did we take any risks? What about the security? Is everything set up properly? And so the, the next wave of work, and it, and it carries on today, is, you know, how's the security? Is it set up properly? Are my users safe? Are my documents safe? How do we manage you know, devices now that no one comes into the office anymore, those old systems that we used to have for patching and updates? What's the modern way to do that? And what I've really found that we've, we've, we've truly done over that, that growth period is partner. We've, we've become 
like a go-to resource for other MSPs. So whether they're very big organizations who have a huge portfolio or just tiny, you know, one-man shops that don't have that niche expertise in 365, they come to us and we kind of just back end and, and background and partner for them. And either that's just you know, giving some advice and guidance, or it's actually just taking on a project and delivering it for them. But yeah, we've gone from, you know, one man in his bedroom, essentially, to there's a team of five of us now. Um, and we are just signing up for our fancy new offices in Leeds City Centre. But we've been working in some great office space at the moment through a great partner organisation of mine. Uh, but we're now taking on our own space, beautiful mill building right by the river, just phenomenal growth. And, 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 and if... The, the listeners are interested. You know, I'm happy to be candid with the numbers. You know, we did uh, sort of 50K turnover in year one, 250K turnover kind of at the end of year two. And we're on track for 600K this year. So just over half a million in what will be our third year. Um, I'm blown away. And I, I have to say, this isn't me. This is this is the guys. You know, this is the team that deliver it. Um, I might be the face and I, I get, you know, all the attention sometimes. But it's it's the team behind me that do a phenomenal job. Oh, that is amazing, Scott, and you deserve all of that success. You know, I've talked about knowing you for a long time. So first of all, congratulations. So much to unpack there, and we'll get into that. I know two questions uh, that immediately MSPs listening to this are going to want to know uh, the answer to. The first one is, yes, we'll include all of Scott's contact details so you can get in touch with Cloud Nexus <laughs> and talk about partnering up. We'll include all of those details in the show notes for this, so don't worry about that. But secondly... That explosive growth, I can almost hear some MSPs going, okay, what's the secret source to the sales process? You must be an awesome sales machine. Now, I know, Scott, that you're very open about your sales process. And in fact, you don't hire salespeople, do you? So tell us more about that. No, if if anything, I would say that we are terrible at sales um, <laughs> in as much as we, we have no outbound motion to find opportunities. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I've tried. You know, we've, we've spent huge amounts of money on on kind of LinkedIn lead generator programs, uh, you know, with experts who, and, and they genuinely understood the MSP space. They were genuine UK experts with great networks who just couldn't get us leads. We, we spent thousands, and I mean like 20,000 or more on, you know, Facebook advertising, um, which just got no leads at all. From Again, from an agency that had good reputation and it brought in zero leads. Um, and, and it came to the point where I've just gone, you know what, I don't, I don't, I don't believe in any of that because it's not authentic. It's it, people can smell that it's not us. You know, those messages are not coming from us. And I think people work with us because they like us. They want, they want to see and hear from us. So we have absolutely no sales motion. We, we haven't had in over 12 months. Um, and I can genuinely say, fingers crossed, touchwood and all those good things that, that leads just keep finding us customers keep finding us and i genuinely put that down to the amount of effort that we put into our social media channels so you'll have seen that we do you know some youtube videos and we try to be quite consistent with that it's been a challenge i'll, I'll give it in the last month you know with covid and, and not being able to work in the office as often but the videos that we've put out onto youtube and onto linkedin have genuinely created revenue for us they're genuine i mean i can tie fifty thousand pound contracts to one video you know, one customer spent fifty thousand pounds because they watched a video, and if you if you've seen any of our videos, if, if anyone listening has seen any of our videos, most of the time it's 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 not a sales message. You know, all the time it's not a sales message. I don't I don't sell on those videos. But, you know, we'll be talking about these headphones that I'm wearing today to do this conference call. We don't sell these, but it's useful information. It's useful information that businesses want to know, and it just helps people see that. We're happy to give information away. We don't have two heads. We can talk technology if we want. Um, you know, we understand things like Teams and Microsoft 365, but we also understand headphones. You know, it's, it just, it puts a friendly face to it. And we we don't have outbound sales. And I don't intend to hire any outbound sales. And I'll tell you why. Because I've been in those large MSPs where there are tiers of people before you get to the person who actually knows what they're talking about. And I'm talking about like the, the sales account manager or the door opener or, you know, all those kind of roles that we have in sales, the opportunity finder. And then they'll get a first call and maybe bring in a pre-sales person who's kind of half sales, half engineering. I've, I've, I've run that world. I've, I've lived that world. I understand it you know, entirely. And then eventually at some stage through the sales process, you get to talk to the person who's going to do the work. Usually you get to talk to that person. What we found is, is really working for us is that 
although we don't actively you know go and find opportunities when they do call and when they do speak to us or they do send in a web or whatever when we get on that first call they immediately recognize that the people that they're talking to are the people who can fix that problem we understand where they are we understand what the challenge is and our approach to sales might be slightly different as well. For, again, from especially from the big world that I'm from, where you go in and you listen, and there's Scotsman, and there's all these kind of you know wonderful sales programs that I can't remember. But the the whole idea was solution selling. You go in, you understand. Let's craft a solution. Let's make it just for you. We go in the other way. So we go. We see where you are, and, and, and we empathise, and we understand, and we chat, and we you know, we we help them understand we're on the same level. We understand where you are this is where you need to be and where we have the solution this is where you need to be and here is how we're going to get you there we don't we don't design something special or custom or different this this is the solution and this is the journey that we're going to take you on now that works for us right because we do mostly 365 and azure work so we have a very niche portfolio but i'd encourage anyone i mean Surely every MSP is selling 365 stuff these days. So have some pre-packed defined solutions because I tell you what, we we just go, here's the answer. Here's how we're going to get you there. And we already have like all the documents, all the paperwork, all the sales description. We have the presentations that they're all there ready because we kind of sell the same thing over and over again. Um, but that just takes down all those sales barriers, it, it, you know, and it makes it a really easy process, especially when they feel like... A, so you guys actually are the guys that are going to do the work. Uh, I had one uh, prospect who called me and he said, yeah, I've seen one of your YouTube videos and, and we chatted for a good hour, two hours, I think maybe even about what he was doing with teams and where he was going. And he was thinking about direct routing. Should I go with you know this direct routing partner? Should I do it myself through Microsoft? And we talked for about two hours. And, and in the end, I didn't sell him anything. He said, I don't want to sell you anything. I just want to guide you through this conversation. And he's like, cool, okay. Can I can I get your name again? I was like, yeah, I'm Scott. He goes, you're the guy on the video. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's me. You, I'm sorry you, you watched me for 30 minutes and now had a two-hour conversation. He's like, oh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize it would be you. And I think it's just that, that that authenticity I'd put it down to is that you know, you see us on the video and then you talk to us and that's us that's how we are and you know you, you you're not going to speak to some sales guy in the middle and I I'm not trying to take anything away from those sales roles I you know I've got some great friends in in sales I genuinely have um, but I just think for us it's not how we want to work with customers you know we want to work with businesses or work with you know other IT partners and the person that you speak to is the person that can solve your challenges. Uh, and, and that agility, I think, really works. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I was casting my mind back to when I was running an MSP, um, and my competitors at the time would say, why are you blogging? Why are you speaking at user groups? Why are you giving away all this info for free? Perhaps we'll talk about that in a little bit. But at the time, I said to them, well, I think it builds not, you know, um, my expertise. It shows my expertise to people. It builds trust. And people ultimately do business with people they know, like, and trust. So yeah. it's, I think, you know, what you are doing here is the epitome of that going forward. You're not bothered about whether you're giving the information away for free. People are going to pay you for your expertise. They want to work with you. So congratulations. Again, kudos on that. And I think huge lesson for anybody uh, listening here. Uh, perhaps we'll delve into that a little bit more. Before we do, though, you've shared what works for you, what doesn't work for you. You also work with a lot of managed service providers. What's the one mistake that you see MSPs making with cloud services that makes you, Scott, it makes you want to shake them and say, stop doing that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's, probably two, there's probably two or three things that, that makes me want to shake people sometimes. I think like a, a big bugbear of mine in the bigger service providers is putting profits before customers. And what I mean by that is, that there is a fantastic solution that's there, that's readily available. And I'll, I'll stick to the Microsoft world because it's what I know best, but there's something fantastically available inside a Microsoft portfolio. But the MSP doesn't make as much margin as if they sell their own homebrew version of that. Right. Because they don't, they, they only make a tiny bit of margin selling the Microsoft license and there's nothing for them to manage and it's very difficult for them to wrap a service around. But this homebrew thing that they have, well, the, the profit margins are literally like 70 to 80% if we can sell this thing versus 5 to 10% over here. And I understand that from a financial perspective and I, I genuinely do. But it's, it's a short end, right? It's, it's, it's a real short journey. It's a short customer uh, life cycle that you're going to have because 
they're going to realize really quickly that the, there's a better solution. Everyone else is doing it this way and it's cheaper and faster and better and you keep having outages. It's just, it's such a, a horrible way to deal with your customers. You've, you've, you've started to look at your customers as a commodity and a line item for income, maybe because you're PE backed and I get that when you're PE backed, it's all a focus on profit. I've, again, I've lived that world, but it's just horrible. But I think when we start to, to treat customers that way, and, and really, it's profit before customers. And you just lose the care. You lose the agility. You lose the interest. You want to sell them this. You don't really want to sell them anything else. And I think that's a shame. I think at the, at the smaller end, and, and something that probably resonates a bit with the, the bigger bit as well, is is not keeping up to date with, with modern services. Mm. And again, it's it's that whole thing of, you know, we do things this way. This is how we've got things, you know, done and packaged up. And this is our stack that we sell to customers, but not, you know, what do you call it? Like, uh, you know, checking the temperature of the water, not checking what's happening in the market, not keeping up to date. Now, I understand every, everyone's busy, right? We're all busy looking after customers and, and everyone gets swamped. But you've got to carve time out to make sure that we're still offering the best solution for the customer. And if that means that, you know, there's a new product that's less effort for you, less hassle, it works better, it goes down less, and you make slightly less margin, well, the economy is in there to say, do that because you will have less headache, less tickets, less problems. Yes, it feels like you're making less margin, but I guarantee you by the time you take out all the pain and hassle and time and effort over here, you're actually better off. And your engineers will be happier because they're dealing with less niff naff and trivia on something that just runs. Again, I'm, I, you know, I'm thinking of a lot of the 365 type things there where people are still using those homebrew things. But I just think there's so much there where we, you know, the, the smaller MSPs that I work with, we go, oh, well, we use this tool set or we do this thing and we have this on premise and silly things. We, we roll out our own antivirus product because our engineers say this one's better than Defender. I'm just like, at, at that level, nobody really cares. If you go on any of the, the score sheets or whatever for antivirus, you'll find that they all say one's as good as the other and this one's better than that one and this, that, and the other. It's opinion at the end of the day. The reality is something like Defender costs you nothing. You don't have to have a management engine. You don't have to have a third-party contract. You don't have any of those things. just kind of tied in and just bloody works. Here, you've got a management overhead and a separate system and different licensing and more things to manage. So I just make it easier on yourself. Make the stack easier on yourself. Make it less admin, less overhead, and you will have more time to spend with those customers who really want you you know, to help with their actual business problems. Don't just be the, the good techie guys. Well, your system's patched and up to date, Mr. Customer. That's cool. But we're just about to buy a new company and I need to know the best way to integrate them and what are we going to do with all their emails? Make time for those conversations and then less time for all the niff naff and trivia. It's part of our, again, one of our mantras is, you know, if, if we are great at these two things here, again, one trick pony, 365 and Azure, we have partners for everything else. People come at us for SharePoint. We just go, we don't do SharePoint. Unless it's a file library, we don't do SharePoint. You want our mates over here. Uh, what about Dynamics? We don't do Dynamics, but I tell you what, this team over here are amazing. Go and talk to them. And we don't even do that thing where we go, yes, we do Dynamics. <laughs> and for £850 a day, how much do they charge us? 550 £850 pounds a day, we can sort out your dynamics challenge. We don't even do that. We just go, you, you, talk to each other. These guys want dynamics. You guys are awesome at it. And I've actually had those partners come back to me and go, mate, we, we have to give you a rebate or something. And I've got, I'm not bothered. It's, it's happy business for you. Go ahead. Um, I feel like I wandered off track from your question, but I'm sorry. Not at all, not at all. <laughs> so much good stuff to uh, to unpack there. So thank you for sharing. You know, one of the things... Uh, that I would say up front, I get on my soapbox quite a lot about managed services, the fundamental tenet of managed services, lowering your cost of support, yeah. increasing your revenue. And for all the reasons you talked about, you know, it's going to, if you add new services, if you add new solutions in there that genuinely help your clients, it's going to reduce the number of support tickets you get. It's going to increase your profit and going to free up your time to spend more time with the client talking about the stuff that's genuinely important to them. So I've been banging the drum, you know, especially over the COVID era, most of the high growth MSPs that I'm seeing Scott, are adding three to five new services this year alone yeah. to their portfolio. They're not doing it just because they want to increase their revenue. They're doing it because they know it will lower the cost of support and free up their time 
to do more cool stuff with the clients. So yeah. absolutely uh, agree with you. And I'm, you know, the other part uh, to to this that you said about partnering up with other businesses. I'm such a raving fan of that model because it worked for me when I ran my MSP business. We did what we did. The core competencies really well. We teamed up with other people to yeah. do all of the stuff. So when a client approached us and said, do you do CRM? We said, no, but let yeah. us introduce you to some. So rather than that thing, and I'm not suggesting anybody listening to this has done it, but saying, yes, we can do that for you. And then scrambling away, <laughs> grabbing all the books and YouTube videos and going, crikey, we've got to work out how to do this. So such a raving fan of the model that you're using, Scott. I will say, I'm not your only raving fan, though. I was speaking to, it was actually Philip Morgan over at Pax8 said, you've got to get Scott on the podcast. I'm like, of course, I must. But the team over at Pax8 who were making you know, massive positive disruptions to the MSP industry um, themselves, they absolutely rave about you. So <laughs> firstly, you know, I wanted to, to pass on that uh, positive <laughs> gossip. And secondly, how important are partnerships with the likes of companies like Pax8? How important are they to you? Oh, it's huge. I mean, Philip is, is amazing. Our account manager over at Pax8 is, is amazing. And, and we've done some, um, you know, kind of launch briefings with them where I've, I've yeah. been on video and just literally as, as they're kind of explaining to new partners, you know, this is this is what we do and this is how we work. I'm just kind of chipping in every two seconds and going, oh, guys, you've really undersold it there. Here's, here's how you really help me as an MSP. Um, and I think I've done that so much so that the, the audience members have gone, uh, how much is Scott getting paid to say these things? And I'm like, <laughs> like they, they gave me a water bottle like if you go to any of the things you'll get a water bottle um but no it, pax8 so for, for anyone who's listening who doesn't know are basically a, a new distributor if you like for software licensing in the uk they've been in the us for for quite some time uh, and they finally launched in the uk just at the very late end of last year start of this year um and what they've done is they've come at software distribution from a, der- a very different way which is to understand this might be crazy to understand what it is that msps actually need from a software distribution partner and that part to your question, that's the bit that's really important. I want to work with with vendors and distributors or whoever it is who understand that we're an MSP, who understand, you know, we have a responsibility to our customers to deliver this quickly, to get it up and running, to resolve their support issues really quickly, to have it at a great price point that I can make some margin on, to pass it through to my customer and have all this thing just kind of work seamlessly. But also to be able to go to you and say, hey, you know, we're having a challenge. We have a technical query. With this, this hasn't worked out properly, and to get some real response. And the thing that Pax8 do there is is, is a few different things. I mean, their, their their portal system is fantastic. You know, it's it's instant provisioning. And I'm I'm not doing a sales pitch for Pax8, but it's it's why it makes a difference to me is that we spend as little time as possible in that tool. We get in, we do what we need to do, and we get out. Even better we give our customers access so that they can do ads, moves, and changes on licenses. It sends that through to our ticket system, which sends it through to our billing system, and I don't have to touch it at the end of the month either. So this whole thing now is about distribution understanding. Like you said earlier, I want to spend my time with the customers. I want to spend my time helping them, shaping them, moving them. You know, What does technology do to make their business better? They sell shoelaces. Great. How do you sell more shoelaces? By using the technology better. Let me help you do that. That's my passion. All this distraction in the background of ordering licensing, canceling licensing, sorting out billing, I don't want to deal with that. And there's so many partners that we we still deal with you know, for, for software or for, you know, for other services where it's just, oh, can you can you send me a fax with the purchase order number on? And I'm like, what? It's 2021. Why am I sending you a fax? Yeah, we need you to send us a check. I I don't have a checkbook. I, I genuinely don't. I find another way. Um, and it's it's important for us to have, I think, partners that that understand who we are, understand our customers, our role that we play in between, and then give us the tools to make life easier. And and Pax8 are one of the guys that really, really get that. Um, and it's been it's it's been great working with them. And anything I say on their sessions, genuinely, it's just because it's it's easy to say good things about a great experience. It, it really is. Oh, it's wonderful, wonderful to hear. Two things that jump out there. Uh, first of all, we'll talk a little bit about the partner briefings in a minute. But mm-hmm. you gave away that Pax Eight gift people the uh, the water bottles. 
Oh yeah, yeah. These these Yeti water bottles. These are. We'll, we'll include that on the uh, the video version of this. You're going to start a stampede of people <laughs> going to be calling the team wanting uh, wanting those water bottles and things there. But secondly, I guess question would be, what advice would you give to MSPs listening on how to leverage their relationship with? vendors, uh, distributors like Pax8. Because I will say up front, Scott, you and I have been in this industry for a little while, probably longer than that. And most of the time, most of the MSPs that we know, their relationship with their vendor distributor is avoiding the account manager phoning them because they want to sell us something. It <laughs> sounds as though your relationship with Pax8 is completely different to that. So what advice would you give for people for leveraging that relationship? Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I've, I've, I still have some of those <laughs> suppliers when we go up. I know you're just trying to sell me something and you get the email in, hey, I just wanted to have a quick catch up. Hashtag sell me something different that I'm not using today or ask me why I haven't sold enough of your products this month. Yeah, um, I have a few of those. I think that the big thing for me, and you're right, Pax8 is, is the other way around. I go to them when I want something. They're not chasing me. Um, our account manager is a great guy and checks in and it's genuinely a check in. Hey, mate, how are the kids? Hey, how's your week going? I've just been doing this. Just random chit chat, like we're, you know, actually partners or friends in, in a business relationship, not that they're just trying to constantly sell me something, which is really nice. But I think if you're going to have those relationships, you need to be able to see what's in it for you. You know, we, there's an awful lot of things around, you know, market development funds um, and, and other ways that you can go to market together. Um, where you can actually then start to bring in leads and opportunities for you as a as a, an MSP, and I think that those are some of the things that just kind of get left on the table. And I think we had a copywriter who did some copy for our website. If you see, it's in some very very stark language, which I love. Uh, but he he emailed me once and just went, um, "Wait, I just want to know if you've got any more work on." Uh, and I think he said, "A shy burn gets out." That's a phrase it's, from a phrase from yeah, my part of the world. It, it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shy burns getting out. Yeah, um, and I was like. I love that. Now that I would say that's the same for for MSPs and their and their vendor partners. You know, if you look at the organisations like Datto, uh, there's fantastic you know MSP support funding in there to do marketing campaigns or activities or make a video. Please, if you're listening to this and you don't make videos, go and make some videos. I'm sure we'll talk about that a, a little bit more. But you know, use some of that funding to to make a video and get yourself out there, get yourself out on LinkedIn or YouTube or something like that where you can be seen so that you can then start to build more opportunities. It can't just be a one-way street where you're giving them money for to buy those licenses or buy those products and services and then marking it up and selling it on. They want you to sell more. You want to sell more to more customers. So figure out how you can have a relationship together that drives more things. And as I say, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, although I will still say, I have a water bottle from Pax8 and not, not much else. But. <laughs> and we, should, we should translate that for, for our um, North American and Australian listeners. Shy Burns get now to is a yes. that is in Newcastle upon Tyne and other parts of the north uh, north of England. It yeah. means, uh, so a burn is a child. So shy children get nothing now. So it's basically you've got to ask for things if you want to get them. So there we go. We'll do the international translation. That's, that's perfectly fair. <laughs> and good call. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say as well, the Pax8 dashboard, without turning this into you know a whole advertisement for Pax8, we, we genuinely are fans here. We're not saying this because we've been asked to, but the Pax8 uh, portal, the dashboard there is incredible. We actually recorded a, a video demo uh, with Tom Welton of Pax8 uh, that I'll include a link in the show notes. Please go and check that out. Really, really cool technology. I want to move things forward and touch upon something that we've already alluded to a couple of times. So you've mentioned about you know speaking to other MSPs, uh, sharing knowledge. You've also mentioned about recently being involved in the Pax8 UK, uh, a, a Pax8 UK virtual launch briefings. Once again, you were helping to educate your competitors, for want of a better word. I love your attitude about being very open and giving away your knowledge freely to clients, partners, competitors, basically, Scott, anybody who will listen. Now, I used to do it when I was an MSP. You do it now. Are you and I completely nuts? Why do you do this? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it's, it's, it's just genuinely this part of my heart for the industry as well, is just to just give and, and share knowledge. But um, you... And possibly in that first time when we met back in 2012, recommended a book to me called The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. I read that book many, 
many, many times. Um, and it, it just resonated with me that that is absolutely, you know, a great way to be. If anyone's listening, hasn't read The Go-Given by Bob Berg, pause this, go and get it, give it a listen on Audible, come back in about an hour. It's a very short book. It's lovely. Um, but the whole thing for me is that there's, there's, there's enough opportunity, there's enough customers in this whole marketplace, even if we just stick to the UK, but it, wherever you are as an MSP, there's enough customers for, for everyone to help and, and, and work with them that we don't have to fight over secrets, you know, like I've got a special secret source way of doing things. Don't be wrong. My, my entire business is built on 365 and Azure, two very, very big open platforms that there's a huge amount of information about. But part of, I think, where, where we just we just love to give that advice and guidance because we know it will come back to us at some point. And I will, I mean, we just don't have the time at the minute because the team is so busy, but we have on our roadmap that we're going to do more real technical how-to sessions designed for MSPs so that they can go, hey, how do I configure Intune and conditional access policies and multi-factor authentication? Here's exactly how you do it. Because there are Microsoft videos, there are articles all over the place. But again, we have this best practice build that we use and we're, we're going to show that. Here's the best practice build. Here's how you do it. Here's how we do it. And I don't care that another MSP can pick up that video and start selling that service to their customer. Good. That, that's not my customer. I wasn't talking to them anyway. And I hope you do a good job. And I hope globally we all have better, more secure 365 environments because we put something out into the world. But I also know, and this this goes back to you know that, that video I mentioned earlier where we, we won a £50,000 piece of work. We put out a whole video around, should I move my phone system to Teams? And I went through in pounds and pence the differences of what you would pay and where, who you would pay it to and how much it would cost. And, and I got people coming to me saying, are you, are you nuts? This is like our pre-sales guys have to do this with the customer and it, and it takes us hours, but we want to get them into the sales funnel first before we give away this information. I'm like, why? Just, just put that information out there. And what will happen is one of two things, one of three things. Okay, someone will, will take that information and go and do something useful with it. Awesome. That's good. I, I hope that you do that as an MSP, genuinely. Um, a customer will see it and say, hey, I, I I see what you did. I don't quite understand all the bells and whistles, but you guys clearly do. So can you help me with? Awesome. And, and by the way, the customer there could be a direct customer. It could be another MSP because they look at that and they just go, we don't know this stuff inside out, but you, you obviously do. So can you help us? That's where we get at least 80% of our work, if I'm honest. Um, and the third thing is that, the, I've, I've, I've already forgotten when my first two were, but the third thing is, is that nothing, nothing happens. Okay, so people watch your video, they don't do anything about it. Okay, cool. But in, in the first two instances, you've put something out that's made the whole MSP space a bit better by sharing that knowledge. Or secondly, you've then won yourself a lead. And, and, and again, this isn't why we do it. But that, that's one of the, the other sides to it is that we will bring business into us. Genuinely, I just want to see people doing things better. I don't have, because I've, I've, I've been in the M&A space where we've bought and sold MSPs, we've bought, we've grown, we've acquired and we've grown. And it's just this vicious fixation on the bottom line and margin and customers come second. And I'm honestly at a stage where I just want to look at it and go, how can we actually give back and if that turns into business for us, super. If it just helps somebody, better. That, that's where we are, and, and that's our mindset. And honestly, if we had more time and less projects, we'd, we'd do more. We'd make more videos. We'd put more content out, and we will do. It's, it's a commitment for me for us to keep doing that. But we are busy with projects. And having said we have no outbound sales motion, it's because we've made these videos or articles or even just posting in the Tech Tribe um, I'm sure you've talked about the Tech Drive many times on on, on this show, but uh, I wish I had more time for Tech Drive. I genuinely do. I go in and every now and then I'm like, oh yeah, I know the answer. Let me just let me just share that answer with you quickly. Oh man, that's genius. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just do this, this, this. Press this, this, this. Go here, um, or you want one of these? I I love doing that because it's so nice just to be able to give back and have the time to give back. And I, again, if I I had more opportunity, I, I would just keep doing that. Well, let me put you on the uh, spot here, Scott. I was going to ask you privately whether you would come on a tribal gathering with me to answer uh, Office three, um, M365 questions, Azure questions, things like that. Would you do that in, say, September time? 
I'd love to. Not not just love to, I'd be honoured to because the, the tech tribe has given so much to us and to me and my whole team that it would be a delight to actually give back to that community. So, yeah, oh. yes, genuinely. Thank you, mate. Really appreciate that. I, I'm going to move things forward. We'll talk about the tech tribe and other communities a little bit shortly, but let's talk tech for a moment while we're on the yeah. topic. Yeah. The tools and solutions that you're seeing emerge in the marketplace that really excite you what does scott riley get excited about in terms of technology nowadays i I have to say last night i saw a post in the tech tribe that maybe just "Ah!" and i got super excited and it's it's so nerdy but i it just it it delighted me in a way that i can't explain Um, if if you're an msp and you have lots of office 365 customers you will know that there is not a single central portal that you can go to that shows you all of your customers and all of the security risks and any issues that need remediating there isn't one and so we've all looked for third-party tools to do this and i have tried many Many, 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 many of them. And they all want, you know, two pound a user or a hundred pound a tenant or whatever it is. And they all do some of it. They don't do all of it. And I'm just like, oh, I need an answer for this. And in the background, Microsoft have been lurking away with something called Project Lighthouse, which is their MSP centric dashboard. They finally, if, if anyone hasn't switched onto MSP yet, it's Microsoft. And, and, and I cannot wait for them to see the success of, of this and hopefully build on more. But Lighthouse finally gives us a dashboard that shows us all of our tenants and we can flip through it quite quickly. Here are the security risks. Here are the devices that aren't patched. Here's who hasn't got antivirus. Here's who hasn't got MFA. And I saw my first quick glimpse of that dashboard about 10 minutes before this call and was like, oh, I, yes, yes, and I want this, and and I'm, I'm joining the user voice community because I can already see and go, yes, but if you could do this as well, even better. Um, so that really got me excited. But I would I genuinely, again, I know I'm a, a Microsoft fanboy. We, we only have one trick. I've talked about this. Um, but the, the stuff that's coming through, through from Microsoft 365 in terms of security, so like using Intune now, an endpoint manager to manage Windows deployments, to make sure they're patched and updated, push out the, what was group policies in the old AD world, push those out and manage them centrally because devices aren't coming into the office anymore push out software, use Windows 10 Autopilot. All of this cool stuff is there. And and again, MSPs are still going, well, we do gold image builds. You know, we get the laptop, we send it in from distribution to the office. One of the lads will build it off a gold image and then put it in the box and we'll ship it to the customer. And I'm like, no. Windows 10 Autopilot, let's, let's do this differently. Let's not ship the box in and put it on the desk and get an engineer to build it from a gold image and then ship it to the customer. Windows 10 Autopilot. Let's set up what what bit of Windows do we want? What software do we want to distribute with it? Let's join it into Azure Active Directory. And let's just send it from distribution to the end user because they're probably at home now anyway. End user gets it, opens it up, signs in. And all right, it takes about 20 minutes, but it sets itself up. It installs all the policies. It installs all the software that they need. Gets them to a logon screen in about 20 minutes. And they can be using things like Outlook and Excel and Word. And in the background, it's not just Microsoft stuff. We could be streaming in you know, Adobe Premiere or whatever it is that they need to do their job. That can kind of be loaded in afterwards. These are the kind of modern ways of working that we are talking to MSPs about now rather than that traditional SCCM or Gold Build or or even, you know, we we always deploy Sophos or Panda or whatever it is, Nod32 antivirus. That's still going. But anyway, one of those. And I'm like, Defender, dude. It's again, it's just you're simplifying, you're centralizing, you're reducing your costs, you're making life easier on yourself. So genuinely I'm a huge 365 business premium fanboy for, for your customers as an MSP, less than 300 users. It's the best it's the best bundle I can find. And we put it out as many times as we possibly can and then actively go around and turn off third-party tools, antivirus, mail filtering, content filtering, MFA solutions or 2FA solutions. Get rid of all of them. You just you just need this. So here's an interesting question for you. The MSP industry has been hammered recently, hasn't it? We've seen the solar winds breach, uh, yeah. Kaseya recently, yeah. you know, tough times. The one thing I will say how the community has come together to help one another has been absolutely brilliant. So this is in no ways, you know, uh, hitting on uh, vendors, slamming vendors whatsoever. 
But there has been the question around, MSPs have been asking, well, should we change our approach towards using RMM, remote monitoring and maintenance tools? Scott, do you think there is a future, do you think there's a future not too far away where MSPs could use the Microsoft toolkit instead of going to third-party vendors for MSP-specific tools? I genuinely do. I, I don't think it's there yet, if I'm honest. I think I think it's still a blend. Um, it's it's the remote access that's generally the the bit that's missing. Um, you can bake remote access into the M365 tools. There's um, there's a relationship uh, with Team Viewer um, that you can kind of connect in and license. It wouldn't be my preference. Um, and I think that's the bit that's that's still missing. Everything else that you would want to do in terms of kind of general health monitoring, security monitoring, you know, application push out patch levels, all of those things are kind of managed really well within Endpoint Manager. And it gets better all the time. And this is the thing that I would challenge MSPs to do is if you've if you've written Microsoft off from a security perspective, and let's be honest, we all did years ago when we went, yeah, I've installed Windows and it comes with a firewall, in quotes. I'm, uh, I'm going to put a proper firewall on it. Oh, look, how cute. It comes with disk encryption, but I'm, I'm going to put on something that does that properly. Oh, look at this. They've got a VPN. I don't think so. Here's my proper VPN. And, and we kept layering on tools and tools and tools to make Windows secure because it wasn't. It's moved. It's moved a bloody long way. And I I genuinely encourage people to just come along. I think I said at the top, you know, look at your stack, look at the services you want to offer to customers and just have an investigation is what can we do now with endpoint manager, with conditional access policies and MFA and all that great goodness that's wrapped up in 365 business premium. I sound like I'm on a sales pitch for Microsoft and I, I don't mean to be. It's just... For us, in, in you know, what's powered our growth over the in the last eighteen months is the simplicity of the toolkit that we've used. And I'll be honest, we don't have like an active RMM platform. We don't have one. We do use Synchro, which is for ticketing, but we don't have that RMM function. Everything we do is done through Intune um, and Endpoint Manager to, to manage all the devices. The the gap that I find is remote access. And so I find if we do need to remote on, so sometimes you know we'll, we'll end up using Quick Assist, which is built into Windows. Um, but most of the things we do are just are just done through Endpoint Manager. And I can genuinely see that's going to keep evolving. And that's why I said my hope for Lighthouse is that they really start to tune in. Now. Holy crap, there's this whole MSP community. Like, yes, we're your partners. We've been here for years. Please give us some tools to manage at scale these fantastic deployments. I'm hoping that Lighthouse is the start of that and that we can start to see this shift from them into helping us. Again, might be all eggs in one basket. I guess that's the that's the caveat side of things. But you know, this this is one of those crystal ball things. No one could have seen Kaseya coming. No one could have seen the solar winds coming. They're, they're tools that we we trust and depend on, and we connect to all of our customers. And and I feel you know for for, for all of the community that, that's had that because I would be horrified if that had happened to me at any of the businesses I've worked for, um, let alone the one I'm in right now. And it's just a horrendous situation. And I'm, I'm proud to see the community come together. People like Huntress really stand up and say, hey, you know, we, we will actively get involved and help you. Uh, and again, there's just some of that giving back. I'm sure for them that somewhere in the heart of hearts, they might be thinking, well, you know, people will see us as, you know, someone to turn to for security in the future. Good for them. But they're, they're giving, uh, you know, right now at a time where the community needs it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, ticketing systems are always going to be there, but that combined ticketing RMM, I think that, that is going to start to phase out. Uh, I think RMM, for me, feels old school. And that's why we've we've genuinely tried to avoid it as much as possible, probably to our detriment and maybe going against some of the things I've said earlier about you know making life simple for yourself. Um, but I, I have to be honest, when we, we went to put in the first one, we chose one of the big boys. Um, and I won't name names, but I, I, we went for one of the big obvious two. I'll leave it there. Um, and it's a SaaS platform, right? And it's paid per user per month. They wanted six thousand pounds in setup fees to set up their SaaS tool for me to use. I was just like, and at this stage there was only two of us in the business. I'm like, I'm not spending six thousand pounds for you and your engineers to set up your tool so that I could use it. That doesn't make any sense to me. And I think it was just prohibitive for the small MSP to go with one of those two big vendors. Um, and that's why we've got you know we picked Synchro. It, it works for us. I'm not you know advertising that. Um, We've only just got started with it, if I'm honest. But yeah, RMM, I think, is 
is on its way. I, I think it's had its day. Um, I also think MBLS has had its day, but it's still hanging on somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, the interesting thing about this is we'll, we'll fast forward to like five years in the future, Scott. We'll review this video. If you were right, we'll make a big deal about it. Yes. If you're not, we'll just ignore it. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah we'll pretend I've never about. said it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Before we move on from the Microsoft 365 uh, suite of tools, is there any one aspect of that stack of tools that you think is underused either by MSPs or indeed by end clients? Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's in tune. It's, it's definitely in tune because that that gives you this whole, um, you know, pr- protection and control over your data on on business and non business devices. This is the key thing now. It's not just about protecting data on corporate devices. I can protect data. I mean, this is my personal phone. But the business data on there is protected thanks to Intune and the, and the conditional access policies that we've set up. So if I lose it or, or whatever happens to it, the, the business data on there can be remotely erased without having to register the phone. We're all familiar with those MDM solutions where you've got to register the whole phone. And you know nobody wants that anymore, no, not in the, the, the small businesses that we work with. People come in with their own phone and they want to use it for work. They don't want to have a company phone that's issued to them. Who wants to carry two phones? We've all had that thing. So Intune, I think, is massively underrated. Uh, and it, again, it's come an enormous long way. And it now does and has done for the last two to three years, I think it is, um, has done everything that you kind of had on premise with SCCM and all those traditional kind of tools. So it's patching, security, updates, software distribution, policy management, all of that stuff is now built in. Um, again, if you're an MSP and you're not using Intune or you've, you've kind of written it off a while back and you have a lot of other tool sets, just go have a look. You know, there's, there's loads of videos. Or do you know what? Give us a call and we will we'll just give you a quick guided tour. Again, I, I love to share. We're happy to just show you, you know, what we've done with it and, and the kind of success that we've had in helping customers. Brilliant. So I want to go back to something we said earlier on about freeing up time to spend time with clients to do mm. the cool stuff to actually help them grow their business, be it selling more shoelaces or whatever it might be. So we hear this phrase around quite a lot. And for anybody playing buzzword bingo, this is one you can tick off really quickly. Digital transformation, Scott, we hear it thrown around quite a lot. What does digital transformation actually mean to you and the team at Cloud Nexus? Yeah, that's good. Cool. This is this is hilarious in some sense because I had this this identical question on a on a panel discussion yesterday, and it was oh, wow. tell me the difference between digitization and digital transformation. I was like, yeah, interesting. Okay, but very different concepts. I think digital transformation for me, quite simply, was about especially when we think about COVID, it was about how do we enable this modern workplace experience. There's another buzzword for for anyone ticking them off, but how do we make it so that people can work anywhere? And they still get access to their business data, you know, their emails, their files, all that kind of stuff. But it's secure and it's seamless and it's easy to do. Because what we're going to have in this next phase of, of COVID recovery, especially here in the UK, you know, it, it's different in different places around the world. One of the guys yesterday was from Malaysia and it's still very locked down where they are. And I think in, over in Australia as well. But the next phase of recovery that I'm seeing here with our clients in the UK is they want people to come back to the office part time. And they're actually reducing the number of desks and they're increasing the number of meeting spaces and collaboration spaces and just general, you know, catch up spaces. And they're putting more investment into those. And what that says to me is that we have to have the infrastructure ready for people to be able to come in, and whether they're working in the office, working in a cafe, working at home, it just needs to be the same seamless experience. And digital transformation for me is that whole process of enabling that. And you know, it's the technology that we use in the background, it's the, the devices that we give to people, it's the connectivity that we rely on, but it's it's the, away from the old mindset of you sit in this chair at that desk on that computer with that phone right next to you and you access these files that are over in the server room over there. That's gone. And, and the digital transformation is to take that to enable this modern fluid workplace where we can literally work from anywhere. But security and seamlessness are the, are the two key things that I always wrap around that. And the final thing that can't be missed in any kind of digital transformation is the people. You've got to teach people how to use the tools and how to how to embrace this new way of working, how to use Teams or Zoom or whatever it is, how to share files internally, externally, how to make the best use of it. Because 
the big thing that you know obviously everyone's concerned about when when laptops aren't coming into the office as often as they should for patching and when people are working from home and they're unsecure wi-fi and all those kind of concerns is that, that we're worried about security risks getting in and if we don't teach people how to use these fantastic tools that we've got available they'll find a way to do their job they'll, they'll find some way around it i can't share this file properly so i'm just going to I'm going to email it to my private email address. And then from there, I'm going to email it to the person I need to, to do it on. I had this conversation with someone who works at a very large insurance company. And because of the, the restrictions and everything they had in place, they, they needed to take some work home. So they, they emailed a very sensitive spreadsheet to their Yahoo account. They came home, they did the edits, and then they emailed it back to themselves. This, this, I, I know you read about this all the time, but I genuinely had a face-to-face -face conversation with the person that did this. And I was just like, what did you do, Ray? What did you do? Ghostbusters. Um, and the, the thing was, you, you have to understand the heart of the person there is that they did not want to breach security or, or risk anything or, or do anything out of turn. What they wanted to do was do their job. They wanted to, to put some extra hours in. They wanted to send that file home so they could work on it at home and send it back. Now, it, this was pre-COVID, so I know we've, we've had this. But, but the digital transformation means that they shouldn't have to try and find those workarounds. We've enabled this modern fluid workplace, and everyone can work wherever they want, but it's safe, secure, and they're taught how to do it properly. That's, in a nutshell, 10 minutes later, my idea of digital transformation. I love it. And we're going to have to clip that out and use it as the go-to resource for what <laughs> is digital transformation. That we're doing. Hey, let me turn things on its head a little bit. We talked about how cloud being a good fit for, you know, uh, clients in that scenario that you just talked about. When isn't cloud a good fit for clients? Can you give some scenario where perhaps you've advised the clients against a cloud service? Do they even exist nowadays? No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I have yes. one fit for all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you buys it, you loves it. Um, no, it's it, there are a couple of instances um, where cloud isn't a good fit, and and you can you can think of some really obvious examples when we see people who work with lots of of graphic files, or lots of um, photographs, lots of digital media that needs to be as close to the processing point as possible. And so when we work with digital marketing agencies who record huge amounts of footage and photographs, it's better to have that in the office because what we need is great office capacity. Don't get me wrong, we'll back it off off-site you know, with a backup, but you need good local, high-speed local access to all those files so that they can get their editing jobs done. You try and put those video files in Azure, for example, and then suck them into Adobe Premiere and do your, your 4K editing, you've got no chance. You've just got no chance. So there, there are some really good use cases. And now, that's from a, a kind of a practical perspective because of file size. You think again about people doing uh, CAD drawings. Um, we work with a couple of construction companies who have very, very large documents that they need to shift around. Actually, that's worked really well with things like OneDrive. Um, so having the OneDrive sync from the central file server onto their laptop, they double click. There's a slight delay. They need good, fat, high speed internet, but you know it works for those guys. But if you're then going to start editing them in CAD, Again, you need that local processing power. So again, those large CAD files tend to work better on a local environment. The one client that we worked with just, just last month where we said, I, I totally understand cloud is not an option, 365 is not an option, um, was a defense uh, contractor nice. um, who do something defensey that I can't talk about, but they were a defense contractor. And clearly the files and the information and even the emails that they had were incredibly sensitive. Um, and although the, the Ministry of Defense here in the UK is, is on Office 365 for some of the workloads, this material was, was of such a nature that we just had to say, no, this, this has to stay on premise. Um, and, and there was a, you know, a couple of different options there that we looked at, including an option for Azure Stack, if any of the, uh, the listeners are familiar with that, which is essentially still giving you the entire toolkit of Azure, but the data always lives inside your own private little cluster of servers that lives inside your local data center for you. Um, so yeah, I think there are still options, but if you are you know, a professional services business or any other kind of you know, admin heavy, people heavy, sitting at desks or sitting at computer heavy type organization, the cloud is a fantastic fit for, for you know, 90% of businesses. I nearly said 80 and it was that tried 80, 20 Pareto's law, but no. 
it's good for 90 percent of businesses but there's definitely some cases where it's not a good fit yeah makes sense and for anybody listening to this who's interested in those sort of edge case use studies uh, that we talked about i did an interview with norb doberlin of nets barn um, over in the us and norb's entire business is around dealing with local municipalities local government police uh, force and things like that so uh, go back and listen to that episode it is a fascinating look at the uh, the niche side of uh, security in the uh, in the msp space i've never asked you this question before I've heard about it, but talking of cool projects, is it true that you designed the technical platform which supported the comic relief Red Nose Day? Or is that something that, that, no, that I've just made that, up? No, no, no. That well, I mean, that goes back a, a long time. But yes, and, and that would have been back in my more technical moving to management type days. Um, yeah, wow, that's a long time ago. So um I can set the scene for you. So, so comic relief. I, I, I'm sure it's known worldwide. Um, yeah, we probably yeah. better explain it for the benefit yeah. of the international. Huge international charity, um, and every two years they run a, a telethon. Essentially, so they have a TV show. They take over BBC One here in the UK for many, many hours on a Friday night, um, and they encourage everyone to donate to the causes that they're supporting around the world. And it's incredible incredibly important that the the phone lines are all working so that people can phone in and make donations but this was early in the days of kind of online donations as well and so you could get online and you could pay with a credit card and you could make a donation now the way that you work with comic relief is is entirely pro bono so the organization i worked for at the time the service provider i think at the time they were called gx networks probably they changed the name many times um but we were offered the opportunity to take it over from Cable and Wireless. Cable and Wireless had had it for two years and they'd done a uh, Red Nose Day and a Sport Relief. So they alternate every year. One's Red Nose Day, the next year it's Sport Relief. They'd done their turn and they were looking for the next service provider to kind of do this free of charge because it's a lot of work. Not only is like the, the, the design and the setup and the build and the, the operation, there's also stress testing that you have to do much earlier in the year to make sure that it's ready you know, for, for people to come on live. So... We turn up at the Cable Mars data center. They gave us like a whole heap of equipment, uh, load balancers and firewalls, tons and tons of Cisco kit fresh from the uh, Cisco corporate philanthropy program, Linux servers, uh, Solaris boxes, Sun servers, all kinds of stuff. Wow. Okay. So we took racks and racks of equipment, put it in our data center. We built this whole thing. We, we stress tested it all in the January. Comic relief is, I think, March, if I remember correctly. We stress test it all. We're ready to go. I'm working with the lovely Charlotte Mellon, who was the program lead over at Comic Relief at the time. Um, and we had everything good to go. And with four weeks left, Cisco came along and said, guys, guys, I'm so excited for you. We've just got a million pounds worth of equipment from the corporate philanthropy team, and it's all yours to use on Comic Relief. We've got our latest 6500 chassis. Here's our new ACE engines. What's an ACE? It's an application content engine. It's like our new load balancer, firewall, blade, does everything you want. It's a dream. It, it, it could be a dream. Okay, yeah. I, if we'd have had more time. No, we're going to use it. This is what we're using for the live event. Okay, we have four weeks. Um, so, yeah, literally me and my team were given this latest cutting edge and, and genuinely like pre-release software on these like thousands of pounds of blades of, of, of Cisco equipment. And we had to, yeah, I mean, we knew the general flow of, of threat, but we had to design the platform, build it, test it, run it and have it up and running because in four weeks, people were going to start putting credit card donations through this web platform. <laughs> it was a, does squeaky bum moment translate internationally for the audience? Because it was a it was a lot of work, yeah. But so we, so we did all this, and on the day, I can genuinely tell you this: we had side by side these big sixty five hundred switches, big rack based switches for people who don't know, and they've got these multiple blades. And the whole idea was, if this box over here goes horribly wrong, all the servers are connected to this box as well, so it's okay. They kind of get this seamless failover, and two of these latest application content engines, absolutely bulletproof, SSL decryption, everything. Whoa, they do the whole thing. And I forget the exact amount of money that they take in on a 15-minute interval for comic relief, but let's let's say it was like a quarter of a million pounds every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, 
one of these content engines would just fail for no reason. And we would scramble and have to get the other one to work properly, make sure it's working. Okay, okay. And then 15 minutes later, that one would fail and we'd have to get the other one back up and running. So the entire telethon event, there's me and my team sat in a data center in Harbor Exchange in London, right next to the servers in case we have to run in and physically intervene. And from like 6 p.m. to like 2 a.m., we got invited to the Comic Relief BBC after party. We couldn't go because we were we were still sat in the data center, making sure these things didn't fall over. And I can I can genuinely say there wasn't a blip for anyone who came to that website that day for that, because it's one day, you get one shot at this. I guess let's make that clear for the audience. You get one shot at this. Um, and yeah, we, we designed a platform, built it within that four weeks. We reconstructed the whole thing and then sat and babysat it every 15 minutes, getting these things back up and running. Me and my guy, Brett, which is okay. There was a great guy, Dave Rogers from Cisco was in the room. Just everyone, all eyes, everything we could do to keep that thing going. And yeah, successful event and again it's one of those things that yeah i'm super proud of that we we did something amazing and we supported them managing to take in millions of pounds in donations that year that then went out to be used for good causes and i just think there's other people who maybe wouldn't have given a rip as much as we did and we just go oh it's fallen over yeah we'll get it back up but we're like no this is not going down we're not going to let anyone not be able to make a donation today. And we would get calls, get, oh, guys, they're going to do the Coldplay video again because it was really successful at eight o'clock. So we're going to run it again at nine o'clock. Can you make sure? Yeah, 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 we've got it. And we were just sat there in this little hive of activity. It sounds like this cool command center. It was like some dusty coffee room in a data center with like wires everywhere and laptops and who's got power? I need more coffee. Just go until two in the morning. But honestly, best one of the best things I've ever done. Genuinely. That's an amazing story. And for anybody listening to this who wonders, well, Richard, why do you do this podcast? I do it because I can put my friends on the spot and ask them questions that I've you know, always wanted to ask them, which I've just done with Scott. Secondly, I can let you eavesdrop on the answer. What an amazing story, Scott. And you know, thank you for, for doing that. And a big shout out to the guys at Cisco as well. for Yeah. Oh, that's incredible of them. Love the guys at Cisco. I'll uh, have to bring that up with them. I didn't realize they were involved in that. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Really, really good. Great project. So you clearly, for anybody listening to this, already realizes you're a rock star in this technology industry. You are, <laughs> it's going to make you blush, but you are. But you've also fairly recently, I should say, become quite the video rock star on YouTube. You've touched upon it earlier on. You said about your love of doing these videos. But this is actually, I would say, in stark contrast to most MSPs. In fact, you know, I'll put it out there. People listening to this now, if I said, let's jump on and do a video, it's going to scare the living wits out of the majority of people in our industry. Yeah. So how did you get good at doing videos? Because your videos really are good. Um. So, so there's a couple of pieces to that and and, uh, and some very great advice that, that we got given as well. So I, I had originally decided that video was, was what we wanted to do um, way, way back at the start of this, uh, e even when it was just me, when it was just me and I hadn't brought anyone else into the team yet. Um, so I had decided a, a, a long time ago that video was was what I wanted to do for for how we're going to you know engage with our audience, engage with with people who, who might want to come and work with us or just take some advice. And I decided in it was going to be LinkedIn and and YouTube would be a strong way to do that as well. Um, and I took some really great advice uh, because when I started it, it was just me standing in front of a camera with a webcam like this. Um, probably propped up on the ironing board. I can genuinely say propped up on the ironing board to get the height, um, to, to just get a message out there and just start to communicate with people. Um, and what I found was it would take so long to write the video, shoot the video, edit the video, and then distribute it. And by distribute, I just mean get it ready for LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, that it, it was, I had such a heart to do it, but just not the time. And especially in a, you know, in a growing business. Um, and we took on a business coach last year. Um, and the, the first session that we had was they said, why don't you get an apprentice? And I was like, hmm? they're like, get an apprentice. Then you will spend 10 minutes in front of the camera and they will do the rest of the work. And I was like, genius. Two weeks later, we'd, we'd appointed an apprentice. Three weeks later, they started. And Kaylee, who's our digital marketer, is an absolute legend. Okay, she, she is amazing. She's 
22. She's from Essex. She brings this whole personality and just passion, but she's from a photography background. And I just feel like we, we, we picked an absolute gem when we interviewed and when we brought her onto the team because her passion and enthusiasm for making content is, is it's unrivaled. I haven't seen anything like it. So we get her into the team and I'm like, now I can literally spend 10 minutes in front of a video and Kaylee will edit it, post-produce it. She'll put subtitles on it. She'll get it ready for LinkedIn and YouTube. She'll then take the script that we wrote and turn it into a blog post and put it on the website and then chop it up for little bits of, of social media that maybe go on the gram, as the kids say, uh, or it'll go somewhere else. Oh, I feel old. Um, but it, it's because we had that focus to do it, we're investing in a person. And this might seem crazy to the small MSPs, investing in someone just to do that is 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 a great way to do it and the apprenticeship track was a perfect way to do it because the costs really you know were really lucky in the uk it's heavily subsidized um and so that the, the apprenticeship program is, is a really really great way to get young people into the the workspace um you get someone who's keen and interested you don't have to pay someone who's on super duper marketing or video ed- editing books to start with but we we started with what we had and we had like a webcam a logitech c920 webcam and we were like okay let's now go and this this is the key thing that we did let's now go and look at our competitors who in the msp space is making videos in the uk and putting themselves out there and so we looked at recommendations that i've seen you've done recommendations from pete matheson recommendations from oh what is he called oh his name escapes me but he's the chap who's in the uk and he's always reviewing other people's websites giving them video advice i can't remember his name it escapes me that's mark copeman from help desk habits yeah there's mark copeman yes and so we looked at them and said right who do they say are absolutely smashing it when it comes to video. And we came up with a list of 10 YouTube channels. And we put them all in our, we use a tool called TubeBuddy. So we have competitor analysis. How many videos have you got? How many watches have you got? How long have you been doing it for? And they were our, okay, we've had five views on our YouTube channel. This guy's got 50,000. Oh, okay, we're, we're a long way from them. But it gave us somewhere to aim for. And what we started to do was watch that content and go, if we were going to make that piece of content, what would we do differently? I don't like the sound. I don't like the lighting. I don't like the way that it's delivered. The, the, there isn't enough passion or energy or enthusiasm. What would we do differently to make it us, make it ourselves? And how do we make an enjoyable experience? And then we would find someone who's doing it really well. And they probably weren't UK. There was there was a US channel or a couple of US channels who were absolutely smashing it. We go, right, what's the difference? And and over time, and it's taken us nine months now, we've just invested in lighting and cameras and microphones, but you don't have to start there, but we've invested in that over time. Um, and it's honestly more about just putting the, the focus into where do you want to be? And, and now out of that top 10 that we put into TubeBuddy, we've eclipsed eight of them for views and subscribers and regular watch rates. Uh, because Kaylee is like a hawk when it comes to statistics. He's always telling me, look at how many subscribers we've got, look how many views we've had. Um, but we've eclipsed uh, the eight out of 10 of those people. The, the other two are just unattainable. They're, they're like millions of subscribers and millions of views, but we're on that journey, right? We're, we're, we're going that way, we will get there. Um, but they'll probably be at hundreds of millions by then. But the thing that I would I would say to anyone is you don't have to have all the fancy kits. You know, you can just have a webcam start with this, but be you and be bold enough to go and do it. I've spoken to so many MSPs who go, oh my gosh, you're brave for being in front of the camera. Oh, I, I don't think I could put myself out there. But when you go into a sales meeting, you're you and, and you, you just talk like you and you, you're yourself and there's no, you know, we don't particularly put on any airs and graces as it were, you know, it's just us. And what we love is that it gives people a window into our business. And if that window means that we then become someone they want to work with, that's great. If the flip side of that, and this is where people are terrified, if the flip side is that people watch that video and go, I'm not dealing with that bunch of jokers. Cool. Because do you know what? We were never going to work together well anyway. And that's cool too. I'm okay with that. My team are okay with that. We want to work with people who, you know, we have this mutual respect where we want to work with each other, with our, you know, customers and our partners. 
So if someone watches one of my videos and it's a bit too jokey or it's not quite serious enough, or that boy's not wearing a shirt and tie, cool. We, we were never going to get on, and that's okay. And I'd, I'd genuinely encourage anyone who's in the MSP space to get on video. Just get yourself out there. It doesn't have to be big or long or complicated. Share some advice. Share a story. Share, share an anecdote. Share just something you've seen. Keep the names out of it. But if there's something that someone can learn from it, put it out there. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And the other thing I would say, Scott, is you talked about the top 10 uh, UK MSP video uh, people. If you were to go to the top 25, you might be struggling to fill the list because the bar is so low, isn't it? It's got hardly anybody uses video, yet it is so remarkable. So for anybody yeah. you know listening to this who's thinking, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've lost the lead. I'll never catch up with my competitors. Have a look in your local area, and I'm willing to bet the 99, 9 out of 10 of your competitors are not doing anything at all so you've got a massive opportunity oh god absolutely i i 100 agree with that yeah the bar is so low for entry and and that's why i feel bad that we can't put more content out at the minute because we're just we've just been swamped and, and kaylee's like we haven't put a video out for a month i'm like i know <laughs> the, the bar for entry is low not in terms of just um you know, consistency and and people willing to give it a go, but also quality. The the bar is really low, and and just go and you know go and look at who's doing it. Go and see at what they're doing, and the people that you think are doing it well, the big big companies that you perceive are doing it well, they're big, boring stock footage, big messages and bam soundtracks to them. Nobody's nobody's learning or taking anything away from those. They're just adverts for their own company. And nobody, nobody's buying anything from that. Always think about, like you would think about with your website, what's in it for me? What is it that you want someone to get out of this video? What's in it for me? You want them to watch. What's in it for them? What are you going to give them? What are you going to help them with? What problem are you going to solve? And tell them, for goodness sake, try and tell them in the first three seconds because people are very clicky clicky. <laughs> we live in cancel culture. They'll just click on to the next thing. But you've got to get that message in early so none of this, hi, I'm Scott, this is what we've done. Hi, I'm Scott Riley from Cloud Nexus, and we're a boutique consultancy that does Office 365. <laughs> They've already clicked off. You need to get in. Are you having a problem with shoes? You need shoelaces. <laughs> but it's it's that. You've, you've got to get in really quick. But yes, sorry, Bramley. It's it's low barrier of entry. Please do try. I want some competition. People say I'm good. I don't think I'm good. But... I'd, I'd love some some other people to keep inspiring me to go, cool, I can do better. Uh, I, I I aspire and follow a chap called Pete Matheson. I watch his videos and I'm like, I want to be Pete. And my wife looks at him and goes, I wish you had Pete's hair. Yeah, I, I'd like you to be Pete. Um, Pete, for those who don't know, Pete's got a, a fantastic mohican. He's a lovely, oh, lovely oh, guy. Yeah, I'm very um, well. But yeah, when you look, his background is amazing. The lighting's amazing. The sound quality is beautiful. It's edited well. And it delivers really good messages. And, and all of that just brings together a great experience. And that's where we're shooting for. We're not there yet, but that's that's where we're shooting for. And it's like I would put aside with a uh, like a lifelong passion for learning that I have. I, I have this constant drive. How can we do better? Let's review. What did we do differently? And it's lovely that people say, oh, you do a great job and you smash it. But I'm always the analytical side going, okay, cool. But that one didn't resonate, or people dropped off. What 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 could we change in the message? How can we deliver it faster? How do we how do we make this video work? And it does need effort. I won't pretend it's not it's it's not simple. But the rewards, when I said to you earlier that we don't have an outbound sales motion, our, our leads come from because we put things on LinkedIn and we put things on YouTube. Those are our if 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 those are anything, those are outbound sales motions. But yeah. we don't sell on those videos. <laughs> Seems so counterintuitive. It's just about, it's about, as I say, just giving people a window into your world and building that trust that you talked about earlier. Um, and people buy from people. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I hope it inspires uh, somebody listening here to go, right, I'm going to give it a go on video, podcast, whatever it might be. Get there doing it because the bar is low. And, you know, people do business with people they know, like, yeah. and trust. Yeah. You mentioned your business coach earlier. You mentioned, you know, you're influenced by people like Pete Madison. You mentioned the go-giver, Bob Berg. You've been influenced by 
who else influences Scott Riley? Have you had any mentors or uh, coaches? How have they helped you? Yeah, so so actually we have Pete Matheson as a coach at mm-hmm. the moment. Um, Pete is, uh, again, for those who don't know, he's, he's a, a chap who built an MSP from the ground up by himself, started in his living room uh, with him and his wife. Um, and he built and ran it for 10 years, roughly, and then sold it last year, just before lockdown kicked in here in the UK. Um and, and then decide to set up a coaching program, sort of teach people what's going on. Now, I mentioned to you, I've, I've been in MSP for 21 years. I like to think I know what I'm doing, but starting a business was a totally different thing. And if you read the E-Myth Revisited, Michael Gerber, a, a must read for anyone who's running. I call it business. the MSP Bible. Nothing at all to do with managed services. No. Everything to do with managed services. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That and the Phoenix Project, two absolutely awesome books. But yeah, that helped me understand I'm the technical expert, but what I actually am is I'm the technical expert but I'm also the, the CEO and I'm also finance and legal and sales and accounting. And I, when you draw out the, the map of, of everybody I had in my previous businesses where I would run the cloud team with these hundred engineers, yeah, but there was a whole legal team and sales team, and finance team, and customer service team. And now I have all those jobs. Um, so it was a big influence on me to understand, okay, I need to quickly outsource and, and set these things up. And I tried programs, I tried coaching programs, um, some very famous coaching programs that just didn't gel with me. And it was because, not that, not because it wasn't MSP specific, it was because they just, those people had been on a coaching course and hadn't run a business. And it was, I saw Pete put a post on LinkedIn that said, you know, thinking of running some MSP coaching, anyone interested? I was like, me! I think I might have got first post first um, because he's just done the journey that we're, we're starting. We, we were, you know, one year into the journey of building an MSP and he's just sold one that he ran for 10 years that he started from scratch. I'm like, we have so much that we can, we can learn from you. It was Pete who said, video is the right choice. Go and get a digital marketing apprentice. And two weeks later, we got one. And, and, you know, we've taken off from there. I have taken so much valuable advice from Pete. Um, and, and not just there, but in, you know, in other tools that we use in the business and you know, marketing automation, sales, uh, sorry, you know, um, mailing list automation, all, all kinds of things that I hadn't considered or thought about. And there's been so much value that we've had from that. Um, but I think like in, in, in a wider world, there's, there's always people like, um, you know, Daniel Pink, when you read some of those fantastic books, I take a lot from books. I used to spend a huge amount of time in the car. And so audio books are my way of learning that way. Um, but when I talk about this lifelong, you know, attitude towards learning, I, it, it is a real thing. I will constantly listen to audio books. Um, people like Marcus Sheridan, his approach to content marketing is, is very similar to Bob Berg. It's give, 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 freely share, freely share, because your competition are trying to make these things sound insanely complicated. You want to move your mail from on-premise mail service to Office 365. Well, all right, well, we'll write down all these requirements. We'll get the engineers to have a look at it, but it's, ooh, it's, it's going to cost a lot. And you go in and go, what, you've got, 120 users. Yeah, that'll take three days. Here you go. Here's the step of works that we do. Here's the fixed price. And they just go, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, this this is how long it should take. Stop trying to make it sound ridiculously complicated. I think that was one of my MSP gripes from earlier is just please, please package your services and make them easy to consume. It just makes life so much easier. But yeah, you know, Marcus and, and, and meeting Marcus at that event and, and reading his book subsequently um, has given me a huge insight into just freely giving that information. Share, share, share the Bob Berg mentality because it will pay back to you. And that's been a huge influence. One of the other things that I can't discount, and it, it's almost like a, a negative influence, I guess, but it's Having been in that m a space where we've bought and sold businesses and I've seen the attitude towards customers and staff as kind of disposable assets or numbers on a bottom line, because that, that's the horrible reality of, of PE-based MSPs, it really is, is having seen and experienced that and seen the management mindset and the way that people are treated has completely shifted how I want to treat people and how I want my staff to be valued. And I say my staff, that's probably the first time I've said 
my staff because that's not how I think about them. I think of us as a team uh, and people jokingly call me boss and I'm like, there's no bosses here. This you know, this is a collective and we're doing something awesome together. But it, it's made me really value those guys and make sure that I listen. I mean, there were five of us or there are five of us and we've rolled out a tool called Office Vibe which asks them questions on a weekly basis that I would never think to ask. And it gives me the feedback. And from that, I then go, do you know what, guys? You're right. We don't currently support any charitable organizations. What, who's got, who's, who, what, what, what have we got a passion for? What can we work together on? Um, you know, and it's just, it's those kind of things that have just made me really focus in on. I want us to have a fantastic experience. Work shouldn't feel like work. How do we do that? I tell you one. The, the other guys, and I'll, I'll call it quits there. Otherwise, I could go on all day. But no, please do. This is great. One of the other guys who really influenced me is a guy called Aid Cheatham, who runs Cooper Parry. Um, Cooper Parry are a accountancy firm. Okay, and by definition, accountancy firms are black, white, grey, and boring. Um, and and he just has this total. You, you want to talk rock star? He has this total chilled out surfer dude rock star he's the ceo and i meet him and i think he was in double denim which might be a you know might be a fashion disaster but i think he was he's just in jeans and like a surfer t-shirt and his hair's all kind of you know askew and he's like dude how's it going what's going on with work and i'm like you're the ceo of a very very successful times i think that they're, they're in the top 10 now top company to work for in the uk Office is like Google. There's like there's trampolines and there's segways and there's you know, there's not quite slides, but it's it's just like a gorgeous environment. One of the first people to adopt work from anywhere forever before COVID hit. You know, breeze into the office. There's there's 400 people in their business, 200 seats. So it was never designed for you, for everyone to be in all at the same time, but just such a forward thinking. Yeah, we do accountancy, but it doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be grey. In fact, in the Birmingham office, there was a gigantic pink plastic ball in the reception. I was like, what's this? I go, like, oh, it's just decoration. But they just had this flip it. Just take the perceived view of your industry and flip it. And IT gets that rap. We are boring. Yeah. You know, IT is boring. And I'm not saying we're the super exciting rock stars, but... You know, I want that. I want people to to be so proud of where they work and the place they're a part of and the brand that we carry. And I know we don't have a brand. We've been going for two years. But I, I hope we build that brand. And I hope that the people that work in the business, you know, you know, love that brand and, and are passionate about being here. And it's it's those experiences, both positive and negative, that have shaped how I'm approaching building this business. That's um brilliant insight into the mind of scott Rayleigh. thank you for sharing that mate really appreciate it bob berg we have had on tub talk before bob a massive influence of mine as well i share that with you uh, marcus sheridan um i've got to know marcus a little bit spoke on a couple of events uh same bill and my good friend chris marr uh connecting with marcus actually asked marcus the other day if he'd come onto the podcast so he's going to be on in weeks to come so anybody listening if you're not familiar with the work with marcus sheridan you will be very very soon mm. huge influence there uh, and Pete Matson, who you mentioned, we never had Pete on the podcast, and yet I know oh. Pete, you know, chat to him all the time. You've and got so to get must, Pete, I, yeah. I should reach out to Pete because I think it'd be really great to uh, to have on the podcast as well. Yeah. So. Look, you seem incredibly happy with where you are in life at the moment. I've known you for a little while. You've always been a very positive person. But what does success look like for Scott Rayleigh at this stage of your life? Oh. <laughs> That, that is beautiful. It used to be, I think it used to be the big heart, sorry, the big house, the big car, you know, the, 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 you know, the happy family. Um, genuinely right now, it's, you know, the, there's a lot of it, like I just talked about, is, is you know, the, the, the business is successful, but not at the expense of our staff. In fact, in our company values, it's, it's our people, our customers. And, you know, and, it, and it's in that order deliberately because we don't want to work with people that are are, are going to detrimentally affect the, the mental health of the people that work in the team. I want people to love this genuinely. You know, I have that passion for it. Success for me in business is that is that you know everybody loves what they do and we have a great time doing it. It won't be every day, and I'm not naive. I understand that. I've, I've done this for many many years, but I've never run my own one. But I've, I've run teams for many years. And I know every day can't be you know all sunshine and flowers, <laughs> but 
I genuinely want people to be overall happy and enjoy what they do. And if they don't, then that's cool. Let's find a way for you to move on and let's do, or, or do we need to retrain or shift or do something? But let's, let's figure that out together as people, you know, in this organization. Personally, I don't know, but are a real crossroads at the minute, you know, we've, we've, we've settled down so much, you know, since the, uh, you know, and I, it almost seems crass, but I've, I found financial freedom after we had the, you know, the sale to the PE. I had my tiny shareholding. We don't have any debts, which is 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 a really nice, comfortable place to be. So it gave me this opportunity to start Cloud Nexus without this. Oh crap! There's a mortgage to pay or any of that kind of thing. So that gave me the freedom to do that. And now that's starting to get to a stage. And it's it's only this week that I've realised that genuinely, sort of almost two years in, where the team that I have. It, it, are able to just kind of take that and, and almost run with it. So I've had to take this week out because we've had some COVID troubles this week, uh, and so I'm looking after the kids. Other than other than chatting to you today, I'm, I'm I'm you know with my kids this week. That's unbelievable. I'm, I'm you know nearly two years into a new startup business, and I can take this two weeks out to just spend with my family, and it's the freedom that that's provided. And I think that's why I say I'm in this kind of transition where, holy crap, this is. This is really working. The business is really working. The customers are happy. The team are happy. And I can actually take a step back because something's happened and I can just spend some time with the family. And that's that's amazing. That that's that to me feels like success. It's that freedom of, of being able to work in the business with a fantastic team and and have the space to spend that time with my family when, you know, when we can. Don't be wrong, we all had far too much family time last year in lockdown, <laughs> okay? I, I, I totally feel like we had far too much family time. <laughs> but but now it's it's back to kind of, you know, we're almost getting back to business as usual and just having this freedom to to do what I, what I want to do next, you know, my kind of next phase of, of development, you know, with the business is if I can continue to, to kind of step back and then give back more, and that's you know through video, through community events. I'd love to be part of the the, the tech tribe event later in the year. But if I can start to share more of my experience, I think that is what I would love to be because that's that's where I get my kind of intrinsic you know value or my intrinsic. I forget the expression, but it's, you know that's where I get my joy. If I put it as simply as that, is being able to share and then see someone take that knowledge and go and do something with it. That's that's what I love to do, and so that's that's what I hope for my kind of you know future stages as we carry on with Cloud Nexus and and for me personally. Oh, that is so uh, inspiring to hear, my friend. You know, I really really enjoyed this conversation. I think listeners, you know, listening to this will agree. You are a very inspiring fellow, very very motivating as well, and I hope the listeners share the energy that I've got from just having this conversation with you today. So we're going to have to get you back on the podcast again at some point very, very soon. You're going to regret saying you want to share more of this because I know people are going to want to hear more. But for anybody listening to this conversation now, uh, they want to reach out to Scott Riley, continue the conversation with you. What's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, I mean, there's some great options. I mean, you can email me directly. I, I no issues, but there's no gatekeepers. Um, so just you can email me. It's just scott r at cloudnexus.co.uk, and I'm sure we'll, we'll put that on as well. Um, but you can catch me on LinkedIn by all means. Have a look for Scott Riley. You see me in a big cheesy grin. Um, and you can also follow us on YouTube if you like. YouTube forward slash Cloud Nexus. Now that we have our own fancy channel name, but. Genuinely, you know, I love to share. I love to give advice. Um, I've said this on those those launch briefings that we've done throughout the year. If there's anything I can help with, you know, feel free. Email me. Ask. It might not be an immediate reply. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be really honest. You know, sometimes the mailbox gets a bit swamped, and this week I'm spending time with the family. But email me. I, you know, I'd love to hear from you. And 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 again, if it's about sharing anything about how to do this, and if genuinely if there's any perceived success that we've had in the video or the business or anything like that that I, I i guess i i like to be modest about it that's fine but if if there's anything that you know you've seen that we do I, i'm more than happy to share what we've learned that's magnificent we will include all of scott's contact details in the show notes join me in thanking scott riley for being an incredible guest today thanks scott for your time especially when i know you're at home with the family for taking a couple of hours out of your day to speak to me really really appreciate it my friend no, oh, thank you. It's it's been awesome to chat with you, and what what a great opportunity to be with the Richard Tubbs. So no, thank you. This, <laughs> this has been this has just been a lovely chat, mate. I've really I've really enjoyed really it. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much, Scott. Thanks everyone. See you on the next Tub Talk. 
Hey folks, Richard here. Thanks for listening today. I know you've got a ton of options for who you listen to nowadays, so I really appreciate your support. Do you have any feedback on this episode? Ideas for future guests? Tweet me at Tubblog using the hashtag TubTalk. I respond to every tweet and really appreciate your feedback. Hey team, this is Richard again. Just one more thing before you take off, and that is MSP Insights. Now, every Tuesday, I share my thoughts on the business of IT with you, the managed service community. Thousands of managed service providers already subscribe to MSP Insights. It's easy to sign up, easy to cancel. MSP Insights is basically a short email from me every Tuesday without fail with advice on growing your IT business, plus cool resources I found, discovered, or started exploring that week. It's kind of like my diary of cool things and often includes articles or books I've read, tools I've discovered and events I think you'd be interested in, often sent to me by my friends and Tub Talk podcast guests. So if that sounds fun, a short tiny bite of MSP goodness every Tuesday and you'd like to try it out, just go to go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. That's go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.